Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, good afternoon and welcome. My name is Kirsten Wiley, and I'm here today to introduce and welcome Theodore Gray, who is visiting us as part of the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Theodore Gray is here today to discuss um, his book, The Elements, and also to talk about the importance of public displays of science. Um, the elements are what we and everything around us are made of, but how many elements has anyone actually seen in pure, uncombined form? The Elements provides this rare opportunity. Based on five years of research and photography, the pictures in this book make up the most complete and visually arresting representation available to the naked eye of every atom in the universe. Theodore Gray is the author of Popular Science Magazine's Gray Matter column, the proprietor of PeriodicTable.com, and the creator of the iconic photo photographic periodic table poster that's seen in university schools, museums, and TV shows, from Mythbusters to Hannah Montana. In his other life, and how many of you might know of Theodore Gray, he is co-founder of the major software company Wolfram Research, creators of the world's leading technical software system, Mathematica. He lives in Illinois, so please join me in welcoming Theodore Gray to Microsoft. Hello. Is this microphone on? You hear me? Great. Okay. So uh, I'm delighted to be here in uh, Microsoft land, even uh, if under somewhat unusual circumstances. Normally, I would be here to discuss software with people at Microsoft, since we do a lot of business with Microsoft in one way or another. Um, but this time around, I'm here entirely uh, at the pleasure of my publisher, who w wants me to go around all over the place uh, talking about my new books, since. That's how they sell them. Um, I, I, I basically have told them I don't do that, but I'll come to Microsoft because it seems like a nice place. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so yes, I'm, I'm basically here simply for the books, not to do with software, although I might happen to mention it in the course of my talk. Um, these are basically the result of uh, what I would refer to as an out-of-control hobby. Um, by out-of-control, I mean I now have an almost full-time employee that does my hobby for me because I don't have time for it anymore. <laughs> um, so uh, a little bit of background. Uh, so this, this basically got started uh, when I was reading a book called Uncle Tungsten by Oliver Sacks, an outstanding book, highly recommended. Um, and he has a chapter where he starts off talking about a periodic table that he visited in the Kensington Science Museum when he was a child. And I had this picture of a table you know, a table with legs that had elements sitting on it, because that sounded to me like he, how he was describing it. And it was horribly disappointing to discover in the next paragraph that it was actually just on the wall like everybody else's periodic table. <laughs> just, you know, that, that was just crushing to find out that the world didn't have a periodic table table. So, um, <clears throat> so I built one. Uh, this is what it looks like uh, shortly after I finished it. Um, and this is what it looked like a couple years later, um, because you see it has, uh, it has compartments underneath each of the engraved wooden tiles. You can lift them up and underneath there's a spot to put the elements. So I felt obligated to find those elements and put them in those spots that I'd created. Um, and uh, here's Oliver Sacks who came to visit my periodic table uh, um, after he found out about it. So that was a nice satisfying little complete circle there. Um, uh, so let's see. So actually, quite shortly after building it, it um, yeah. So this is the the 2002 Ig Nobel Prize, uh, which is basically a joke prize that the Journal for Irreproducible Results gives out. Um, uh, in this case, for the construction of a periodic table table. Um, I have no idea why they chose this. It, it, I'm incredibly honored to have been, you know, given an Ig Nobel Prize. It's certainly, <clears throat> it's certainly the highest honor for which it's conceivably eligible. Um, anyway, um, so 
based, as far as I can tell, almost solely on the prestige of the Ig Nobel Prize. Popular Science asked me if I would like to write a column for them. I think they also read my website, which had a lot of, by that time, a lot of writing about the various elements that I put in the table. Uh, they asked me if I would like to write this monthly column. The first one appeared in uh, July 2003. Um, and I'm basically still at it. Uh, when I started the column, a couple months after I started, I thought, hmm, in about five years I would have enough columns for a book. This represented a tremendous degree of hubris at the time. <laughs> but sure enough, five years later, like clockwork, uh, it was time for mad science because I had 48 columns and that's about how many you need to fit in a book. Um, so we put this book together and it was published and uh, people like it. Um, it's basically the same thing as the column. In fact, the body text is almost identical. Uh, but um, we got to expand out what had been one page in the magazine to two, four, six. Uh, in this case, this wonderful thing about how to make trapped lightning uh, gets um, two and a half full spreads in the book, where in the column it only got one. Um, and I got to do some more detailed instructions about each experiment that kind of explain exactly why you shouldn't do it, uh, <laughs> among other things. Um, so uh, the other thing we got to do is use many of the pictures that we couldn't use in the magazine because there wasn't room. So this is a great example of that. This is a, if you're tired of, you know, the stale um, store-bought sort of salt that's been sitting underground for millions of years or whatever, and you want to you want to make some fresh salt. Of course, the way that you do that is by blowing chlorine gas into a bowl of molten sodium, uh, and they will react. Um, and the uh, so this this next picture. This is the picture that the art director argued with me for weeks that, that we should use as the main shot in the magazine. And I kept having to tell him, no, no, this is the flaming disaster picture. Uh, not the one from a few seconds before where everything appears to be working perfectly. Um, of course, what happened was that the heat of the reaction, uh, I didn't take into account the net that's holding this popcorn, which we're salting, uh, was made out of some kind of a thermoplastic and it melted uh, almost immediately. And, drop the popcorn into the molten sodium. And if you know anything about sodium, um, you know that's a bad thing. But it is a beautiful picture. And the, the, the great thing about the book is we get to use both because there's enough room in the book. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so the, this book, uh, my, the, the best review that I read of it was written by a chemist for the CNU News, which is a publication for professional chemists. And his first sentence was, he was all prepared to just poo-poo the subtitle. And, you know, say, uh, so it's experiments you can do at home, but probably shouldn't. You weren't aware of the subtitle. Uh, you know, he was prepared to just say, well, you know, whatever. Of course we can do these things at home. And then he actually read the book. And even writing for an audience of professional chemists, he's not sure people should be doing this. Um, so we have a, a very stern safety warning section, which I highly recommend. Um, uh, and it, it, <laughs> the lesson of, for why you should wear safety glasses. Um, but actually, magazine lawyers are, are, are very paranoid, much more so than book lawyers. Um, so although there's some stuff in here that people really shouldn't do, it's, you know, the dangers are carefully described and, uh, and properly disclaimed. Um, and they, they even made me redo this particular shot using, um, th this is an off-brand imitation Barbie, because when I did it with actual Mattel brand Barbies, it was like, no. <laughs> we're, we're not going to show that being done to a Mattel brand Barbie. Um, uh, okay, so um, it, in the meantime, while I've been writing that column, I was also continuing to expand my element collection, um, first at periodictabletable.com, um, which has uh, uh, now something like 2,300 different objects, each of which is an example in some way, form, shape, or form of an element. Um, uh, but, you know, and, and we actually, we do a significant amount of business licensing these images. We're basically the only stock photo library that has a complete coverage of all the elements consistently photographed to a high standard. So uh, textbook publishers and, uh, uh, you know, science documentaries and things like that quite regularly license these images. Uh, and at some point it became clear to me that I need to own periodictable.com. Um, I felt it was not being utilized uh, to its highest potential. Um, 
But if anybody, you know, if any of you have tried to buy a URL, this is a difficult psycho-financial negotiation with the, the person who owns it. Um, but, uh, but after about a year of, of careful, you know, making of my case and carrying suitcases of cash and, and things like that, uh, I, I finally managed to buy it. And I now own periodictable.com, which is a fabulous URL. Um, and so I've, I've really made an effort to, um, to make it um, live up to its potential as an online periodic table. Um, so I published this poster, um, which turned out to be a great investment. It, it was a bit of a leap of faith to think that people would buy a photo periodic table, but they did. Um, and uh, since then, I've developed sort of a whole line of products, which you can find at periodictable.com. Um, of course, the most elaborate example of that is this book that many of you seem to have copies of, thanks to Microsoft, The Elements. Um, this was actually published, you know, these both books through a, a proper publisher as opposed to self-published like everything else, which is, which is not really a financially advantageous thing to do, but it's great for the ego because it means it shows up in bookstores and you can walk in and see your book there, and, uh, which is much harder to do with self-published books. Um, so, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, the book is full of uh, nice big pictures of elements. Um, some of the more popular elements actually get two full spreads like that. Um, and uh, you know, it's just basically lots of big pictures. Uh, so <laughs> it, it raises the question, though, why, you know, why do this? You know, it's, is there really a point to it? Um, because I, I don't really like spending this amount of time without feeling there's a point. So of course the answer is yes, but why? What, what is the point of doing this? Um, so let me give you an example of um, other people who do this. So this past week, last week, was actually National Chemistry Week, which the American Chemical Society puts on uh, every year as their sort of big outreach. They uh, publish a, a sort of a, a curriculum supplement, a little 20-page newsletter, which they print something like a quarter of a million copies of and distribute to schools everywhere. Um, Naturally, because the theme this year was the elements, they have a nice little two-page spread of me, Mr. Elements. Um, so they spend a, a huge amount of money on this every year. And basically, the point of it, as far as they're concerned, is trying to do what they can to present sort of public, uh, or sort of, sort of a, um, positive views of science. You know, why should you do science? Why is this a good thing? Um, and that is essentially, you know, for better or worse, what I've been doing, uh, although I kind of stumbled into it. Um, you know, I write a lot about chemistry. Um, the, the first goal in writing this column is to get something, anything about science actually published in, you know, in, in the venue of popular science, uh, which is not a science magazine by any stretch of the imagination. If you read it, it's more like People magazine than it is like Scientific American. Um, so, you know, I have to uh, find some way of, of phrasing the topic and framing it in a way where it will not actually get replaced by a Cialis ad, which is the fate of you know, any such, you know, such writing which doesn't hold its own. Uh, you know, people are going to pick up the magazine. If they pick it up to my page, they open it, I have to grab them. I have to make them buy the magazine. Otherwise, I'm out. Um, and uh, you know, so there's a lot of beautiful pictures, uh, grabby, so there's the salt one. Um, text that kind of tries to immediately engage the reader. Um, uh, alcohol and fire, good combination. Uh, <laughs> if you're trying to engage the reader and catch their attention. Um, so for example, hydrogen soap bubbles. Uh, this, this is actually a standard demonstration, one that I wanted to write about for a long time. You blow hydrogen gas through soapy water and you get bubbles. And then you run after them with a candle and try to light them. Um, and, you know, for, for guys, you know, in the, the sense of guys, there's really no need for a reason to do this. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but in order to make it a compelling enough topic for the column, I had, it's, it took me a year to figure out how to explain to my editor why he should let me write about this. And the answer was, it's an excellent explanation for why occasionally people come home from vacation to find their roof in their basement. Uh, and their walls scattered around the surrounding fields, and there are always fields around these houses, because their houses heated with propane. And when there's a propane leak, propane is very viscous and heavy, and it sort of settles into the basement and slowly builds up until it finds a pilot light somewhere, and then it explodes. 
And this column is all about why it is that the same propane gas that burns gently in a stove, if you premix it with air, will actually turn into a bomb that just blows your house to smithereens. Um, and that's, you know, that was sort of the thing that would make it able to, people able to relate to it so that I could actually write about it. Um, okay, so I think we got a video of this now. Yes. Uh, right, so there, there's, there's quite a lot of effort put into it. The other thing is you start out with pure hydrogen, then you start mixing oxygen in. When it's pure hydrogen, it, it burns very slowly and gently, sort of like a, a fire jellyfish. There's a slow motion video of it. Um, and uh, then you start mixing oxygen in. Uh, what if we can skip ahead to the oxygen? Well, those are pretty, pretty nice too. Yeah. Right, so once you start mixing oxygen in, uh, it burns much faster. And uh, they were wondering why I had earmuffs on and a face shield uh, until you get to the point where you have a stoichiometric ratio of oxygen to hydrogen. Uh, at which point it's... Uh, this, this, my, my old professor who first showed this described it as causing white lung disease because all the chalk comes off the chalkboards <laughs> when you do this in a lecture hall. It's um, hooked up to a cylinder so of oxygen gas. This is another column I wrote. On. This is so the, the bacon light. lamps. Uh, so there's a device constructed entirely of bacon which cuts steel. Um, and of course, the secret is that uh, uh, you're blowing oxygen through. And in, and in an atmosphere of pure oxygen, bacon is extremely flammable. Uh, and it, it does actually cut through the steel in the end. Uh, and this one, I, I, I couldn't think of anything that this is relevant to, but it's just, it's a bacon lance, you know. So he let me write it, about it anyway. Um, and then I believe we did a, a vegetarian version also, uh, which um, we can skip ahead here. So the secret for vegetarian version is... Uh, cucumber um, stuffed with breadsticks and the, cu the cucumber is the airtight pipe and the breadsticks are the fuel so it, it worked quite well too uh, moving right along uh, I think we'll skip that one um, so we'll have time for questions here actually you're welcome to ask questions um, so, so I only get 350, 400 words or so for one of these columns. It's, uh, I get one page, and I get to do whatever I want on this page as long as it's exciting. And uh, that's not a lot of words. Um, so you know, I have to write something that, that the average reader will understand and uh, not talk down to them uh, and yet try to communicate some meaningful content. Um, a lot of popular science's readers are, are quite young, sort of middle school, high school age. Um, and, you know, I, I feel a responsibility to sort of uh, leave little breadcrumbs for them because I can't actually explain much of this science, but I can leave little hints, you know, words that they can Google or um, Bing, uh, whatever the verb form of Bing is, uh, to, to, you know, they didn't understand it, but they can look it up. If they happen to have an actual science teacher in their school, which is, maybe is unusual, but if they do, they can ask their teacher, um, you know, sort of leave little hints that there's more depth and more to be learned about these topics that I don't have room for here and give them a hook to, to be able to find it. Um, uh, so, you know, it's not so much that there's, there's a lot of science being communicated, but what there is is, uh, is a description or, or a sort of a, an attitude about science, a positive image that this is a good thing, this is interesting, this is fun. Um, it's kind of a game, you know, how much science can I squeeze in before they tell me no, <laughs> you know, too much science, back off. Um, um, and there's actually a lot of precedent for uh, sort of doing science purely for the spectacle of it. Um, in fact, the, 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 the very first generation of professional scientists, people like Joseph Banks and Humphrey Davery and Michael Faraday, uh, they were all renowned as public speakers. And it was, in fact, their spectacular public demonstrations, uh, the public lectures at which all the Victorian ladies were swooning at these, these fabulous men of science. Um, this is what created the public support for the institutions that, that eventually ended up professionalizing science, the, the, the Royal Academy and places like that. 
Um, if it had not been for their you know, public demonstrations of science, the profession wouldn't exist. Um, so, in fact, it was uh, Michael Faraday who invented the Christmas magic show, the Christmas chemistry magic show, which is now an institution at you know, many of your finer research universities will do this every year. This one happens to be at the U of I uh, in Illinois that we filmed last Christmas. And you know, it, everyone has a great time. The professors get to blow stuff up, which of course, normal you know, actual research professors, it's not what you do in chemistry, uh, but they get to do this. And, uh, you know, and lots of kids get to come and see all kinds of fun chemistry stuff. And the hope, of course, is that 10 years later, maybe some of them are going to come back uh, as university students and, and become actual scientists. Um, so that, that goes on. Uh, and, and speaking of Davy, so this is, a, this is my next, next month's column is uh, on the Davy safety lamp, which is an amazing device that um, prevents, uh, it prevented uh, miners from blowing themselves up when they were working, carrying lit candles into mines where the atmosphere was explosive because of methane. Um, and the thing actually, uh, yeah, so we're basically blowing uh, propane gas into the cylinder, which is made out of mosquito netting. And the fire doesn't go through the mosquito netting. Even though the flammable gas came in from the outside, the open mesh of the mosquito netting stops the fire, which is just, it's mind blowing. I, I had no idea it would actually work. But people would go down into mines soaked in methane with lit candles relying only on that effect. Uh, to, to prevent themselves from being blown to bits. Um, so that, that was Humphrey Davies. That was what everyone thought would be his great contribution to the world until people invented electric light and the whole thing became irrelevant. Uh, anyway, um, so yeah, so, so my so more moral uh, message here is that uh, these kinds of uh, um, what I call public demonstrations of science, they were critical in the 19th century and I think they're you know, they're, they're critical now too. There's really a, you know, a very strong anti-science current. There's a, a degree of willful ignorance that uh, we've not seen for something like 100 years. And that's combined with a serious decay in public schools and public you know, instruction on the topic of science. Um, there, I think, is to a greater degree now than there has been for a very long time, uh, you know, a, 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 a serious and realistic threat to the to the presence or sort of the, the prominence of science as the way in which civilization advances. And you know, everyone sort of needs to do their bit to, uh, to do something about that. And one of the most encouraging things that I've discovered in the last few years is that apparently science is cool. Uh, it never used to be. And I think it's kind of like what happened with, um, you know, with computer uh, nerds and such in, during the, the whole dot-com era, that it suddenly became cool you know, to, to be involved with computers and be a hacker and everything. And I think, you know, you can see the same kind of thing happening with uh, science hackers and science geeks. Um, so Make Magazine, for example, is a, a successful magazine and they have this wonderful new science room that they launched not too long ago, um, which is basically uh, for science hackers in the same way that there's any number of resources for computer hackers. And they talk about, you know, biohacking and their programming life. You know, you can go to conferences and people will talk to you about, uh, about genetics in exactly the same way that they would 10 years ago have talked to you about hacking computers. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what Make has done is basically a first semester chemistry course, um, but it's framed in terms of do it yourself. They use words like open source chemistry hacking which I think is ordinarily referred to as academic chemistry. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, but it's, it's their way of looking at it. And, um, you know, and, and, and maybe it's all kind of silly, but on the other hand, some of the people who get involved this way are, in fact, going to transition into doing real science in an academic or a commercial setting or in their basement. Um, and it's a way of, you know, sort of the young generation coming around and, and saying this has gone too far and we're going to recapture uh, science as, you know, as a, a thing that's good. Um, so, uh, yeah, the, 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 it's not lost, but people need to work at it. And that's, I think, the, the ultimately the justification of, of books like this and columns and spending this kind of effort on it is, um, uh, you know, to help with the, the effort of making science be something people actually want. Um, so, continuing. Um, 
We're going to have to go really fast. This is actually an entirely new talk that I'm trying out on you guys. Uh, uh, so we're going to go pretty fast. Um, so periodictable.com is uh, uh, the thing that I've spent really an inordinate amount of effort building uh, over the last couple of years. Um, it has uh, lots and lots of stuff in it, many, many pictures, uh, descriptions of many objects, um, lots of technical data about every element. Uh, so here's you know, everything you can see about uranium, uh, graphs, charts, things that, that illustrate periodic properties. Um, these are, uh, uh, this is a, a decay chain of uranium, U-235, showing how it decays. Um, so, uh, you know, here's, um, well, this is a, a, a slightly smaller decay chain, so you can see the whole thing. Um, something you may not immediately recognize about periodictable.com is it is, in fact, an intersection with my day job. The entire thing is completely generated by a large Mathematica program, which create, you know, writes out all the HTML, it created all the diagrams. Uh, so for example, this, um, this uh, decay chain image, this is a, a portion of the Mathematica code that creates those images. Um, it's nice, you can, you can put the images, uh, you see the cursor there? There we go. You can put pictures, you know, in line with the text. It works very nicely for a sort of visual, um, uh, visual programming environment. Um, and uh, of course, one of the nice things about uh, programs is that once you've written them, you can just kind of push a button. So here we have not just one diagram, but actually a moving, uh, moving, you know, imp version, a movie version of this diagram, um, which is perhaps silly. This perhaps more so than some of the other things, but uh, I think it's actually a good way of driving home the point that this really is transmutation of the elements. The alchemists were not wrong; they just didn't realize they needed a nuclear reactor to do it. Um, and now, in fact, you can, you can make gold if you want. It's just too expensive. Um, so there's actually uh, uh, lots of, let's see, is that playing? Yes. Uh, at this point, I think I'm going to turn the lights down just a little bit. I think we can make it look better, yeah. So um, this video is also created completely in Mathematica. Every frame of it is just direct output of Mathematica. Um, and it would actually be a little bit tricky to do this uh, using traditional video editing software because the, the range of the, the pan and zooms is such that you can't really start with one large video and then zoom in. There's too much resolution there. Um, so, uh, let that play for just a minute. There's a, a lot of images that go into that particular piece of video. And uh, we'll go back to regular. Um, so uh, let's see, okay, now we're going to play, actually, yes, I forgot, we're going to play one little, do we have sound? Mm -hmm. I'm going to skip ahead here, well, all right, okay, we skip ahead right here. This one I'm going to let it actually play, I think. There's antimony, arsenic, aluminum, selenium, and hydrogen, and oxygen, and nitrogen, and rhenium, and nickel, neodymium, neptunium, germanium, and iron, americium, ruthenium, uranium, europium, zirconium, lutetium, vanadium, and lanthanum, and 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 iconic and performance and of the elements. And, indium, and, gallium, and iodine, and thorium, and thulium, and thallium. There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, and boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bisothromine, lithium, beryllium, and barium. Recorded in 1959 and it's never been equaled. There's holmium and helium and hafnium and erbium and phosphorus and francium and fluorine and terbium and manganese and mercanium, molybdenum and magnesium, dysprosium and scandium and cerium and cesium and lead, praseodymium and platinum and plutonium, palladium, promethium, potassium, polonium and tantalum, technetium, titanium, tellurium and cadmium and calcium and chromium and curium. There's sulfur, californium, and fermium, berkelium, and also mendelevium, einsteinium, nobelium, and argon, kryptonium, and radon, zinc, zinc, and rhodium, and chlorine, carbon, cobalt, copper, tungsten, tin, and sodium. These are the only ones of which the news has come to Harvard. And there may be many others, but they haven't been discovered. And he actually gave me permission to, to do that. I used that in a promotional video for my song. And, uh, and uh, even though he's, he must be 120 years old by now, but he has email and he's very nice. And he's plan planning to put his entire repertoire in the public domain uh, in his will. So, uh, nice guy. Um, 
Okay, well, so anyway, there's, there's just more, more, more videos. And um, I, I hope it has to some extent, um, uh, you know, affected your impression about what Mathematica is about, the fact that it's actually the, the best way of making videos like this. <laughs> People probably don't really think of technical computing software as, uh, as a way of making videos. But anyway, um, so uh, uh, let me show you another little thing that I, that I think is an interesting excursion in the element. So this is the decay chain for U235. Um, and you notice it links together quite a few different isotopes. Um, it starts with U235, it ends up with lead 207 and 206 as the two possible stable endpoints. Um, if you go uh, choose another one, this is U238, it's in the middle, the little yellow thing is U238, and this is the, the decay chain of everything it decays into, as well as going backwards, everything which at some point passes through U238 in its decay chain. So that links together even more of them. And it turns out, uh, if you look at the entire, there's about 3,100 known isotopes, and almost all of them are linked to each other. And so you can build this diagram, which the thing on the top is every single known isotope, and every line is a connection, a decay chain. So, you know, there's, a, there's an awful lot of time and money in that diagram. Probably every one of the dots in it is somebody's PhD thesis who studied that isotope. Um, and the, the thing on the bottom is a, is a magnified version of it. Um, and uh, this is the entirety of the Mathematica code that generated that diagram. Um, and, and, and seriously, that's it. I don't have a whole bunch of stuff hidden behind it, um, except, to the, except to the extent that Mathematica has an awful lot of stuff hidden behind it. So graph plot, for example, is a, a spring electric graph layout algorithm. And uh, isotope data is a function, a sort of data access function, which knows pretty much everything there is to know about all of the isotopes that are known, uh, and you, you just kind of build a network and then you say graph it. Um, and this, this is its automatic layout of that particular web. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's an awful lot of things that Mathematica has built in to do with data. Um, and you may have heard about our, our most recent little development, Wolfram Alpha, which is um, sort of uh, the, the biggest application written in Mathematica, the, the, the entire implementation of it on the server side is, is you know, five million some lines of Mathematica code. Um, and it's available as a free website, wolframalpha.com. Um, uh, this will actually turn back around into elements. So we're just kind of doing a little sidetrack through Wolfram Alpha. Uh, um, so we call it a computational knowledge engine, right? You can, you can ask it questions. It's not a search engine. It's a computational knowledge engine. Um, and it, what it does is, is it does math for you. It, does, it looks data up for you. It operates on it. So here we've given it a formula. It gave us plots. Um, uh, we had a, uh, a little homework day to introduce this to teachers because uh, it does things like this. You, give it, uh, you ask it to integrate something. It, it, you know, it, it can integrate pretty much anything that computers know how to integrate because we have the best in integration algorithms. Uh, you can click the Show Steps button, and it will show you how it did that integral. Um, Students know about this. I think teachers are, <laughs> teachers are still sort of learning about it. Um, but it's out there. It's a free website. Any student can go to it, and there's not anything their teacher can do about it. Um, the phone is buzzing, and that's not going to help them. Um, so let me make this stop here. All right. Um, so it's hopeless to try to explain everything that, that Alpha will do. Um, but so let me, let me bring this back to elements. So one of the things it knows how to do is balance reactions. So for example, I asked it, uh, magnetite plus aluminum goes to aluminum oxide plus iron. Uh, notice I don't actually put in the, the actual chemical formulas, but it knows that magnetite is uh, Fe3O4, which it writes in a funny way for some reason. It knows that aluminum oxide is Al2O3, which I may, may or may not have remembered, and it balances it for me. The question, of course, for those of you who recognize this reaction, is always, how much aluminum do I need? Um, so I say I've got 100 grams of magnetite. And um, if I, you know, how much aluminum do I need? Well, the answer is 31 grams of aluminum. That will make thermite, uh, which is definitely in my book, one of my most favorite reactions. Um, basically, what happens is, and what you don't see captured quite, quite well enough here, is that on the right-hand side of the reaction, you have iron and aluminum oxide. What alpha doesn't tell you is that the iron is white hot liquid iron when it comes out of this reaction. 
And so you put this in a crucible with a hole in the bottom and the iron drips out the bottom as a liquid and you can, use, you can make iron castings that way. Um, and so I will now leave you with the video, um, although actually technically I had better video of titanium thermite. So this is actually the same thing except titanium oxide and aluminum um, reacting to form, uh, and I'm going to turn the lights down here so we can see this a little better, to form titanium metal. Uh, and uh, here, this, this one, uh, yeah, so it reacts energetically, as they say, exothermic reaction. And I intentionally didn't contain the pot spray. So what's dripping down there is actually, it's probably not, some of it is liquid titanium. Most of it is probably uh, uh, liquid corundum or, or aluminum oxide and liquid fluorite, because in this case you use, uh, uh, you use a, 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 a fluorite um, flux. Uh, so a tremendous amount of heat released. Um, so that's an example of the usefulness of Wolfram Alpha is that I, don't, I no longer have to try to calculate how much aluminum I need for each of these thermite reactions. I can just ask Alpha. Um, okay, so, well, thank you very much. Uh, remember periodictable.com. <laughs> and I'm happy to take any questions. Competitor Maple do the same kind of graphics? Mm -hmm. Ah, Maple, call Maple a competitor. That, that would be, um, I mean, no. Not, I mean, you know, Ma Maple, is, Maple is much more of a straight um, symbolic math program. You know, it, it doesn't really have the same breadth of, uh, you know, trying to do everything sort of as Mathematica does. Uh, I think MATLAB is actually more directly a competitor um, in the sense that you know it has image processing libraries and things like we do, whereas Maple is, is much more narrowly focused on you know symbolic math for its own sake. Have you ever sincerely injured yourself in an experiment? Never, uh, never, and and I don't know why. But but actually, <laughs> no, it's because although you know um, I I'm actually an incredibly timid and cautious person as are, I think, everyone who's involved with this kind of stuff. I mean, if you look at you know, people who do special effects or stuntmen or whatever, they're all complete ninnies because otherwise you're dead. Um, so, you know, although I might appear in my public persona to be somewhat irresponsible, um, you know, it, read the safety section of my book. It, it's really uh, fairly straightforward. You don't, get, you, don't, you don't hurt yourself because you make it impossible. You know, you, 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 you set things up in such a way that no matter what goes, you know, what goes wrong, um, you'll be fine. And that's the way that one, you know, this is the way you have to do it, because otherwise you just won't survive. So you mentioned biohackers. Is there other areas of science that you're finding translate well into this sort of medium? Well, I think everyone is trying to figure out eco, you know, e ecological technologies, energy technologies. There's, you know, everyone is trying to figure out what, what could we do? What would be some clever trick that would, you know, save the world or prevent global warming or whatever? Um, I mean, I don't know. I have mixed feelings about it because, uh, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's great to celebrate the sort of, uh, you know, do-it-yourself spirit. On the other hand, it's not clear to me to what extent it works in science as well as it did in computers. In, in computers, you know, people just in their basements invented technologies that, that became, you know, hugely important and took over the world. I don't know if that works in science, in the kind of science where you sort of need to do, you know, lab experiments and, and things. Um, you know, I don't know if 20 years from now some, somebody will have invented the solution to global warming in their basement or not. It'd be great if they did. But people are certainly trying and, you know, even if they don't succeed there, you know, maybe they'll, you know, they'll, they'll move on and start doing things that, that uh, you know, on a scale where it is more successful. So, so I'm intrigued by seeing uh, the kind of mathematical steps that explains how integrated is done. So what level do you have? Is that for the college level? Do you have something down to elementary level or well, middle school so, or high school level? Okay, so here's an analogy. Um, uh, my daughter, well, she's older now, but back, back a few grades ago when she learned how to subtract numbers, uh, I, she had a whole sheet full of numbers to subtract, and I, and I realized fairly quickly none of these require borrowing, right, because they hadn't taught borrowing yet. Um, and so then eventually they teach borrowing and you can subtract any two numbers. Uh, integration is, is similar. The way, that, the way that calculus is taught these days is analogous to teaching subtraction without borrowing because the range of integrals that human beings are actually capable of doing is very small 
in comparison to the range of integrals that you might want to do and that computers can do. I mean, computers are just much better at integrating, uh, you know, doing symbolic integration than our people. And so the show steps button works for the subset of integrals where there are techniques that is plausible for human beings to actually apply. It, it won't, you know, if, 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 this, if the, the integral was actually done using Grobner basis or something and there would be 50 pages of completely impenetrable algebra, it won't show that to you. Um, so it basically tries to show you steps that would be, you know, first, second semester, the stuff you learn in a course on college calculus or, you know, fancy high school calculus. Um, Just to, uh, to ask whether uh, you're able to show steps for lower level of education, like, you know. Oh, yeah, there's, there's show steps for, for um, expanding polynomials, factoring, solving equations. Yeah, there's a lot of, I don't know, you know, not everything, but quite a few things have show steps. So Microsoft used to have a product called the Microsoft Math. I don't know if you probably know about it. I, I've heard about it. I, I'm not very familiar with what it did. Um, yeah. The hard part of going far, of course, is that you need the, the, the underlying algorithms. And that's where Mathematica has its advantage, that you know, it's, it's 20 years worth of very serious, hardcore symbolic math uh, development, which is then you know, available as a resource to Alpha. So you know, Alpha is not something that we just sort of invented. It's, it's the past 20 years of everything we've been working on sort of brought together and given free to the public on a website, which has its own little challenges. But, <laughs> um. So, any other questions? Or? Back. What do you think of programs like Mythbusters? Oh, I love Mythbusters. I, I, think, I think Mythbusters is the best science show on TV. Because although they don't really talk explicitly about science, they use the scientific method. And they, they never question the idea that if you want to know the truth about the world, what you should do is go out and try it. And that is, of course, the very definition of science. You know, don't believe what somebody tells you. Go and try it yourself. Um, so the follow-up is how about something similar on chemistry? Uh, chemistry Mythbusters? Yeah, I think that would be a great show. Um, a uh, mad science show, for example. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. Uh, maybe over here. Um, so of all of the elements you went out and collected, what was the most interesting or difficult or fascinating one for you personally to, to track down? To track down? Thorium is tricky, um, although I found it in my own backyard, uh, figuratively speaking. It turns out there was a company that I have a friend at who has large stockpiles of thorium. Um, uh, thorium is, is probably the hardest for most element collectors because there's nobody that will sell it to you, uh, even though it's perfectly legal to own it, up to 15 pounds, as long as it's not isotopically enriched. Um, uh, but, you know, there, I don't know. I, people keep asking me uh, what my favorite element is, and, you know, it's, I, I don't have a favorite child either, you know. <laughs> they're, they're all beautiful. Um, but titanium is really nice also. Jet engine parts and things are are good. And sodium is good because you can throw it in a lake and it explodes and that's good. Um, so let's see. I think there was another, another question. This is one more or less. Thank you, you know, for this. I, uh, I'm at the right age for the space program and I were children together, I guess. And uh, at that time, there was a lot of science, public science demonstrations. You know, Dr. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Wizard on television, uh, GM sent around people to schools to do science presentations. Popular, uh, science and popular mechanics also were one of my big things, and, and it definitely was. It definitely inspired me to become an engineer. And I mm -hmm. think it did a whole lot of people. Like I think it did, yeah. And I think there's well, a lot less of it now. I mean, it's not that there isn't any, but there's a lot less. There's a lot less, and I think there's also a you know a cumulative effect where poor science education, uh, after a couple decades, it means the teachers got a poor science education themselves, and it's you know it's just like in math. You know, new math is. Uh, you know, that managed to destroy a generation of teachers who are the ones who taught the, the people who are now the teachers. And, you know, it's, it's a hard hole to dig yourself out of. Although, um, you know, on the other hand, uh, we dug ourselves out of nothing, you know, first time around. We can, we can do it again. Um, but I think there needs to be a great deal more uh, time and effort put into uh, rebuilding, particularly the public education system. You, you can't do this by having a few fancy private high schools. You know, it needs to be everybody um, or else the place falls apart. Yep. 
How long has Global for Research had the student license uh, program and what kind of impact do you think has had? Um, we've had uh, student price, I don't know, at least 15 years maybe. I mean, it's since quite early on. That's um, very nice. It, yeah, I mean, for, you know, for, for the people who are willing to buy any sort of software and willing to learn it, Alpha is kind of, you know, the ultimate student license because it's free uh, and it doesn't require learning a particular <laughs> syntax. It's just, you know, you, you type formulas and whatever you think of it, it does a very good job of picking them apart and, and uh, parsing them, turning them into, you know, unambiguous math. Um, and it will be interesting to see. I mean, that's a whole other thread that we, you know, math education reform is equally important to as science education. Um, and it has its own little problems of resisting technology and, and trying to uh, keep its head well buried. Um, and alpha is, you know, alpha is a thing that's, that's harder to ignore because it's free. It's completely free. It has no learning curve. And it's out there. Um, yes. Talk a little bit about your, your visual approach to communicating very complex data, like your book. Like your the book. Slide. Well, I don't know. I mean, I. Uh, is it I, just to make it easier for the, the layman to understand, or is there something? I guess I don't. I don't know that I would really hold myself out as an expert in visual presentation. I, I kind of know what I like, and eventually struggle, and you know, get it to. To look right. I mean, the fact that this entire book is on a black background, for example, which I think is one of its most attractive features, uh, the reason for that is because at one point I, I, I suddenly realized, you know, I had this turntable and I was, I was wanting to take pictures and make VR, you know, things of each of the objects. And I thought, you know, I could put them all together into a poster, but in order to do that, I would have to have a completely consistent background color. And they're photographed at completely different times and they're different scales. And the only color I could think of that I could reliably reproduce always was black. Because anything else, I mean, white, yes, but white would be, that wouldn't be good. So black was just the consistent background color that I could always make this come out on black. Um, and sure enough, it worked great for putting them all together. But you know, that's, you know, it's not like I had an artistic vision that I want black backgrounds. I had a technical problem to solve, and black was the solution. Um, and you know, I, I think it worked pretty well. And, and the, you know, that's one of the things that people you know, think is an attractive feature of the poster and the book and everything is this black background. Um, but you know, it, it kind of like many things, I've just stumbled into it. Um, but yeah, there's quite a bit of work in periodictable.com and the, the graphs, for example, the graphs of elemental properties, uh, trying to make them look good. And, and usually when something looks good, it's because you can understand it and pieces sort of fit together. And so I think clarity, uh, Representation of something that's usually just a table on a wall. You create a physical table of the, of the table, even as a, a visual. Yeah, and that was just a misunderstanding. I mean, there's no other way to put it. It was I was confused. I thought that somebody else had done it already, and and you know, since then, as far as I can tell, nobody had done it. And I, I think you know, if there was something out there, somebody would have emailed me about it by now. Uh, and the only the only other ones I'm aware of are ones that were built after mine, uh, and there's a couple of people who have done it, but uh, it was, I find surprising. I mean, you think something as obvious as building a periodic table table, people would have done this a hundred years ago. Mendeleev should have built a table, but I, part of, of course, is the joke only works in English, um, <laughs> so you know, it, it doesn't work in German. I don't actually I don't know if it works in Russian or not. It doesn't work in German, which is where most of the chemists were. Um, Okay, I don't, I don't know how long we're supposed to go on with questions. Yep, we're probably about done. Thank you. Thank you very much.